Good morning and welcome to our Sunday service at Harvest Rockford um, on our live stream. My name is JT Stead, I'm the student and outreach pastor here um, and it is a joy for me to worship with you guys virtually this morning. If you could just take a moment to hit that share button, that would be awesome. We want this service to go far and wide for God's glory. So that would uh, be much appreciated. Well, this Monday we're also, sur uh, we're, 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 we wanna celebrate Memorial Day. So Memorial Day is this next Monday and we wanna acknowledge and honor um, any of you that have served um, in our military or have lost loved ones uh, who, are, who have served so that we could have the great freedoms we have in this country. Thank you, thank you. We wanna acknowledge you and honor them this morning. Well, I'm gonna read a Psalm, Psalm 18, to get our hearts prepared for um, worshiping God. And it says this, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. Let us uh, call out to our God who is worthy to be praised, our solid rock in which we stand upon that is Christ. Let's worship together.
What an amazing song we just sang. What a scandal of grace it is to think upon the good news of Jesus Christ. It reminds me of 1 John 4, 10. Uh, John writes, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation means that He is the atoning sacrifice, that He paid for our sins on the cross. And He follows that up with saying, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. If you are wanting to know more about the love of God towards sinners, all throughout this service, you're gonna see a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text. 
And uh, I know multiple people over the past couple weeks have sent in prayer requests and have asked to know more about Christianity, more about the good news of Jesus. And so utilize that and we will get back to you um, as a church to help support you, encourage you, and pray for you. So that number should uh, be shown up at the bottom of the screen, through, screen throughout the service. Well, I got one announcement for you. June 3rd, June 3rd at 7 p.m. is our all church prayer night. We're gonna be doing it on our live stream on Facebook. And so um, tune into that, mark your calendars. It's an amazing time to lift up our voices to God who hears our prayers and who answers our prayers. And so, um, Mark your calendars for June 3rd to do that as a church together. Though we can't meet in this building just yet, let's pray that we can soon, right? And we can still pray as one church in different places. So June 3rd, 7 p.m. This is the time of our service where we take the offering and I just wanna remind you that there's three ways that you can give this morning. You could give on our app, you could give online at our website, or you could give by mail. And so um, you could utilize those ways to give this morning. Well, Pastor John is gonna get into God's word, so let me pray for him and pray for us as we hear God's word. Father, your word is living and active. It is, its origin comes from you. You are the divine author of this book. You use many authors, but you spoke through them. Help us to not take this time for granted. There's so many people all throughout this earth who do not have access to the life-giving special revelation of your word, Lord, and we have it. And so fill up our pastor to preach it and, and, and give us humility and expectancy to hear your word and, and give us eager hearts to hear and to do what your word has um, called us to do. Lord, we wanna know more about Christ. I pray that your, your name, that Jesus would be exalted uh, this morning and that we would be spurred on to love you more and to obey you and to trust in you, that our faith would be strengthened through our pastor as he gives this sermon. We're so thankful for our church and we always wanna uphold your word. And so, bless this time. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Harvest, good morning. It's graduation season. You probably know some graduates. We have one in our own home. Olivia graduated this week, and we had a drive-by graduation party Friday night. Uh, just think about that. A drive-by graduation party. Who does that? But we're living in some interesting times, are we not? So I just want to say shout out to all the seniors. Congratulations on this year. Um, Use your newfound freedoms to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Seek Him first, because when you do that, you're going to be in a path of blessing. You're going to live fuller, and God is going to be glorified through you when you do that. Just an update. You may have heard some rumblings that we, as a leadership team, staff, elders, we've been talking about reopening, reopening. And the bottom line is this, um, when the governing officials allow us to have 50 people, then we will begin services on the campus. We'll have two services, so we'll be able to do like 100 people per weekend, um, which means not everyone can come. We'll put you on a rotation. We'll have some restrictions and things we, protocols we'll have to do in order to come. Some of you are like, you're not ready to come, and that's okay because this will be kind of a graduated uh, re-entrance and reopening. We will be pre-recording our services so that you can watch in the comfort and safety of your home. Um, when will this happen? I don't know. It could happen June, July, August. I have no idea, but we'll let you know when it comes. Be praying that uh, as a leadership team, We'll lay out some, um, you know, how to be careful when we come together and also pray that we'd be brave as we come together. At the same time, there's, a lots, of there's lots of things to figure out with this. So we'll let you know when that time comes. But today I want to talk about love. Can we talk about love? What love is? So go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 
We're going to continue our study on love. 1 Corinthians 13. Let me read, starting with verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. But rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Lord, as we open up your word and uh, we bring meaning to it and we crack it open to help all of us understand, I pray, Lord, that you would help me in that process. And I pray that you'd speak even through watching it in our homes. Holy Spirit, would you just bring conviction encouragement, whatever is needed in this moment. But I pray that our love would abound for you and for each other. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's talk about love. Paul is addressing the Corinthian church. And what I want you to know about Corinth, if you think Las Vegas, you'll be thinking the right thing with Corinth. Corinth was a sensuous city, a very sensual city. In fact, it had the temple to Aphrodite's there, and in its heyday, it boasted of a thousand priestesses to serve the visitors. If you called somebody a Corinthian, that was not a that was not a compliment. That meant you were a sexually immoral person. That's right. You could say, boy, Bill is a real Corinthian. You know, he he's he's a Corinthian. Okay. You could that would mean that you were sexually immoral. That's the cultural context that surrounded them, but there pervaded this childish immaturity in the church, which is why Paul takes a whole chapter to talk about love. They had divisions, rivalries over who was more spiritual, chapter 3. They challenged Paul's leadership, chapter 4. They had lawsuits directed at one another, chapter 6. There was careless improprieties in worship and with the Lord's Supper, chapter 10 and 11. They overemphasized spiritual gifts instead of spiritual fruit, chapter 12 and chapter 14. That's why sandwiched right in the middle is this chapter on love. They were using God's uh, God-given gifts to show off instead of to serve one another. And that's not love. They need to get their act together, don't they? Well, yes. Let me just say this. Love demonstrates our maturity in Christ. It displays or demonstrates our maturity in Christ. His disciples would have love as the defining characteristic. So I think it's safe to say, again, Love displays our maturity in Christ. If you have little love, you are immature in Christ because that's the defining feature of Christ's disciples. Now, when I was uh, 17 years old, I became a Christian and I let everybody know at my public school truth needed to be heard and there was few people who were sharing the gospel and I was making up for it. But I did become proud of that. I was pressing other students in my youth group to share their faith. And because I was brave, I considered myself to be mature in my faith. Oh man, did I have a lot to learn. <laughs> I became aware of my lack of love when a girl in the youth group came up to me and said that she always felt judged by me and that she could never live up to the standard that I had set for everybody. It was like a knife to my heart. Loving others around you is far more difficult than sharing your faith, as I found out. I was a prophet, speaking truth, but lacked concern for others. I think at the beginning of my Christian walk, um, the fear of man had a grip on me, so sharing the gospel was a good way to put that to death. But that was just the beginning of how God wanted to change me. Truth and love. Truth and love. Uh, lately, I've been reading a book by C.S. Lewis. Uh, 
It's called The Four Loves. Anybody read the book, The Four Loves? It's, uh, it's penetrating. What a great book. What an incredible mind. Early in the book, he makes this distinction between what he calls gift love and need love. Gift love is totally concerned about the other person. A love free from the need of returned love. It's the kind of love that God gives to us. He does not need our love back. He is free. He gives it generously. He's not hankering for us to love him back. Need love is just that. We are coming in poverty, needing love from another. It's our love toward God. We need him. But the more the, our love becomes Christ-like, the more we can love others with gift love, love that with no strings attached. And to the degree that you can love, expecting nothing in return, is the degree your love is Christ-like. C.S. Lewis said this in the book, quote, I still think that if all we mean by our love is a craving to be loved, we are in a very deplorable state. If our love simply is a craving to be loved, which means I'm going to love you so that you can reciprocate and love me back, then we're in a deplorable state. So this section, chapter 13, describes the love of God in Christ and therefore describes the love we are to give to our friends, our family, our neighbors. Now, what is that exactly? Well, I'm going to deal with just two words today. Love is patient and love is kind. Let's take the first word, patient. Love is patient. What does that mean? Slow to anger. Long-suffering is the word. And that second word does give us a good picture in it, that long suffering. Because when things annoy us, when things slow us down, when people ask something from us, when things take too long, when people want more than we want to give, when they disrespect us, that's long suffering. That's patience. It's when a relationship costs us more than we wanted to give. We have to exhibit patience. We have to suffer long. I would say if all your relationships are beneficial to you, where you get as much or more than what you put into it, your love really hasn't been tested. You don't know if your love is this kind of love. Because love is patient. It's long-suffering. Which means you're giving more than you get. True love is, that's the true test of love. That's genuine love. It reminds me of romantic love. In fact, my son is getting married to Megan Van Penbrook on May 30th. Yes, it's a big, uh, big couple of weeks for us, Dirks is. Um, but it reminds me of romantic love. You know, especially the kind leading up to the wedding day. It's like, love is easy. When you love Love is coming back to you almost equally. And uh, sometimes it gets us to think that our love is special, that our love is unique. Why do we think that? Because when we look at marriages and all the strife in marriages, and we look at how effortless we're loving one another, we think, oh man, we have something very unique. You might, but that is young love. Young love. It's real but it hasn't been tested. You've only seen the best of that person. You haven't seen the worst of that person. And you haven't seen when the pressure of life is on them month after month or year after year. True love is patient with the weaknesses of others. That's what it means. It's slow to anger. So think of patience like a coolant in a car's engine. It keeps the engine from overheating or boiling over. That's what patience is. Now, the jerk says we've always had used cars. Used cars are us. And when we take long trips, we're always going, Lord, keep our car together. 
When we go out to California and when we're coming back, there is this grade coming up to Las Vegas from California that is a slow grade and you're going through Death Valley. It's hot. I remember one time it was 112 degrees and our van was overheating. And so we rolled down all the windows. We turned on the heat, the heat at 120 because we're trying to keep the car from boiling over. But we had to pull over because, and we had to wait a long time. You see, when you lose patience, it's when your anger boils over. And when it boils over, you won't be making much progress in your relationship. If you boil over enough times, you'll ruin the relationship. Love is patient. There is no relationships that endure without patience on each part. But uh, we Americans have very little patience. You know, we're known in the world for zero patience. We don't like to stand in line for any kind of service. We don't like to be told what to do as if we're the only ones in the universe. Because the only person that can have his way all the time as a hermit living out in the, in the sticks. He or she can have whatever they want. But if you're living with someone else, you've got to be patient. Patient. That's what love is. Uh, you demand patience from someone else, but are you willing to give patience? Aren't you glad that God is patient? He's long-suffering. Exodus 34, verse 6, he's slow to anger. He's abounding in loving kindness. Awesome. The reason why we lose patience, the reason why our anger boils over, is because something isn't fair. Can I just remind you, love is never fair. It's never even. It's never equal, which is why True love is patient. It suffers long. You got to get rid of that idea that love must be fair in friendships and in marriages. You might always be the one that initiates, that calls first, that sends more letters, that spends more money, that's more thoughtful, puts more effort into the relationship. Stop keeping record. Stop counting. Love is not fair. Let me tell you a secret. <laughs> the other person probably thinks they're doing all the work. <laughs> That's how crazy it is. They think they're giving more than you in the relationship. They probably think they're doing all the work, just like you think. It's never even. It's never fair. Love is patient. It suffers long. Are you patient? You suffer long because the most exalted, most glorious person in the universe suffered long to love us, to redeem us. It's Jesus, our Savior. And if he lives in you and me, we too will suffer long. We will have the patience to love others this way. So love is patient. One more. Love is kind. Get this. Patience takes anything from others. Kindness gives everything for others. Let me say it again. Patience takes anything from others. Kindness gives anything for others. One holds back, one gives. Patience is like the coolant in the engine keeping the temperature down Kindness gives, keeps giving them rides in your car. You keep being kind to others. Love is patient, it suffers long, but love's retaliation for suffering long is kindness. That's love's retaliation. It's kindness. Love retaliates with kindness, just like Jesus. Titus 3 starting with verse 3, 
For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our day with malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Whew. We, we got some problems. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. See what happened? He suffered long. And for payment for suffering long, He's going to be kind to us. That's our Lord. Christ's reaction to suffer long is kindness toward His enemies. And He tells us that we are to do that with our enemies. Luke chapter 6, verse 27, we are to love our enemies, do good to those who hate you. We are to bless them. We're to pray for them. Why? Because God is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. We are his sons as we love our enemies. Is that how you love? Do you retaliate with kindness, because that's how Jesus retaliated to you and to me. The sweet thing about kindness, it can restore relationships. It's heartbreaking to read of King David and Absalom. Remember the story? Their relationship was ruptured when David would not get involved in a family matter. King David's oldest son, Amnon, raped Tamar who was the full sister to Absalom. David didn't get involved. And for two years, Absalom was just burning inside. And it finally erupted and he put Amnon to death. And then Absalom was banished from the kingdom. David didn't want to see him for years. David had it, had it in his power to bring healing to his son and help to his son and heal that relationship. But he waited too long. Couldn't find it in his heart to forgive him fully. And Absalom grew to hate his father. And it ended up revolting, seeking to kill his father, David. It was all a mess. And it was all because David, he just couldn't forgive. He couldn't act kindly to Absalom. Remember this verse? Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Ephesians 4, 32. Because all of us are like the banished Absalom. We have sinned greatly, and now we're conflicted within. We're sorry over our sin. We regret what we did, but we're angry toward those who have mistreated us. And it keeps us running, it keeps us restless. But we have a father better than King David, King David's son or descendant, Jesus Christ. And Jesus moves toward us in kindness. He forgives us our sin. He restores us to a seat around his table. Oh, how he loves us, though we don't deserve it. Kindness is healing. It's a healing balm to relationships. When you can retaliate in kindness, it brings the pressure and the anger down, and it gives audience to those who are in opposition to you. It can soften their hearts. It can give them hope. It can inspire them to keep going. It even makes them more inclined toward God. Christian, in this volatile world, remember that kindness is a great advertisement for Christianity. Instead of your hostile posts on social media, instead of your fiery responses to your opponents, kindness will be more effective. It can open the gate of an impregnable fortress just by your kindness, and it's Christ-like. You'll remember Romans chapter 2, verse 4, that the kindness of God leads us to repentance. It's his kindness that softened our heart and let, led us to repent. And therefore, as ambassadors of Christ, when we are kind, it also can lead to the repentance of others. It's a healing bomb. Christian, 
chapter 13, as we study this, it's going to expose you. It's going to irritate you. It's going to humiliate you. But this is the love that you have received. We have received this kind of love. And if Jesus is in you, you will increasingly express this kind of love to others. I would just say, let God's kindness soften you again. You know, the kindness of God brings you to repentance, leads you to repentance. And maybe as I've spoken this message in your heart, you're thinking, wow, I, I need to be kind. I need to be patient. Well, let his kindness soften you again. Because the relationship that you have with God, the relationship you have with Christ, would not continue if Christ wasn't patient with you, if he wasn't kind with you. And there are no enduring relationships. Just look at the people around you in the room. These will not endure, not endure well, unless you can be patient and you can exude kindness. Let it soften you again. Let it tenderize you again. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That means he loves you with this kind of love. Harvest, may God give us this kind of love for one another in our families, bringing healing so that your retaliation for suffering long is kindness. What could that do in your home? What could that do in your marriage? What could that do in your friendship? You're going to inspire and give people hope and tenderize their heart and put them in the best place for them to repent and come to Jesus. If you're listening out there and you don't know the Lord Jesus and you don't know this kind of love, I would just invite you to know the love of Christ. It is for you. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You have not sinned beyond the grace of God. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins and to cleanse you. All you need to do is admit that you have them and call out for forgiveness and believe in your heart that Jesus rose from the dead and you'll be saved and you'll start this journey and you will be growing in your love for one another because that is Christian maturity. Growing in that love that's willing to give and doesn't need anything coming back for that love to be given. Oh, that God would give us that kind of love and that kind of capacity. And when we come back to church, when we come back here for church, when we get with our friends at this church, trust me, even in our church, there's going to be people who approach the coronavirus differently than we. Um, and we're going to have to be patient. We're going to have to be kind. But harvest, we can do this. Because if Christ lives in us, that kind of love is in us. And we can exude that kind of love, long-suffering, charitable, and kind toward others. I can't wait to see you again. God bless you today. You are loved. Harvest.